in Austin city budget and a lot of what you learn here can also be applied across the country. We know that it's a national movement happening right now. Uh, and uh, then we'll also be taking your questions. But before we uh, get started, I think I and Chaz are gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, what happened last night, uh, because of course that's really, really important. And this is a joint town hall uh, between my office, I'm council member Greg Kassar representing district four in Austin and the Austin Justice Coalition, uh, because we're really trying to do our best to work this budget in tandem with um, with movement organizations like AJC. But Chaz, say hi and, and and let's talk about last night for a second. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, first I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us on this Sunday. You you all could be anywhere, um, but you find it important to be here as we talk about how we can um, you know reimagine public safety and uh, you know slowly start building towards a world where we have different um, and alternative approaches to public safety. Um, and I think it's important to note that, um, you know, why you have people um, like, you know, the councilman, Greg Kassar, who's part of the, the city power structure and advocates like us that work um, very much within that power structure. Um, you know, we have to pay tribute to the people that are on the front lines, the true front lines every day. Um, and as many of you know, or, or maybe not know, um, last night there was a, 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 a tragic event in which one of those people, um, Garrett Foster, who has literally been out almost every day um, in the name of Black Lives and racial and social justice um, at a piece of protest, um, who, was, who, who was murdered by somebody that was driving through a crowd. Um, so we just wanted to start out um, this particular event by, um, you know, just taking literally a minute to uh, just have a moment of silence as we, as we keep him in our thoughts and prayers and as we continue to do this work in his name. So I'm gonna put this picture up of him um, and we'll just take a moment of silence. All right, just, you know, uh, thank you all so much for sharing that space with us and um, we'll get started. So go ahead, um, um, Councilman Greg Kassar. Yeah, no, um, I, th I think it's really important for us to be reflecting on um, the fact that not only is this an opportunity for real change, but that um, in this moment, we have a lot of people that have come before us that have died and, and also that this movement is born out of a lot of pain um, with the shooting last night with a car driving at people uh, last night um, with people that have died in our own city, like uh, Michael Ramos, who was shot or across the country, like Brianna Taylor, or George Floyd, or well before this last year, David Joseph or Larry Jackson. I'll just never forget um, uh, being in this city, both before being on council and on council during that. Uh, and, and it really reminds us that we are um, trying to, prevent violence in our city. Uh, that is so much of what we care about and what we're here to talk about tonight is how our priorities for so long have not been preventing violence, either violence by police officers or violence by people who aren't police. Um, because there are also people who have been killed in my district needlessly, like Monica Loera at the beginning of my time on council, Adeladio Urias, so many others who have been uh, killed. And what we know is that we do not invest enough of our attention to preventing harm. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to, the agenda is we're going to spend a few minutes where AJC is going to talk about um, their, what people, what they have seen in the 911 call data, because you may not know uh, that in fact, not that much police time is actually dedicated to violent issues of violence. Uh, AJC, you, you guys, I think are also going to talk some about 
um, what people want to see us focus on in the budget. Then I'm going to give a little 101 about how the city budget works. Uh, then we've got a couple of experts who are going to be joining with us about how we could move money over to things to prevent the sorts of harm that we see. Um, then we're going to give a little training where I'll give an inside look on how it is that you can impact the budget process yourself, and then we'll take your questions. So, uh, so Chaz, why don't you kick it off by talking a little bit about what y'all have seen as far as what the police department is focusing on right now um, and where you think, what you've heard from the community about what we should change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to share the screen so people can also follow along. Um, so, so for the people that are not aware, um, AJC hired this, um, this, data, this data firm based out of New Orleans to um, show us exactly how Austin Police Department is spending their time. Um, and what they did was very, very interesting. They took a million 911 phone calls um, from June of 2019 to June this year. Um, and they just broke the data down um, very, very well. Um, and I think this is important because as we're having these conversations around um, policing and defunding the police and reimagining public safety, there's still this misconception that um, police are doing a lot of things that they actually aren't doing. Um, and as you can see from um, the, the data set here that um, data analytics found out that APD um, quite literally um, spends a lot of the time doing non-criminal stuff. Um, and I think the two most important things to, to note in this chart is first the violent crime, because it's, it's been a, a lot of conversation around, well, if we defund the police and they don't have resources, then they won't be able to um, do their job around violent crime and, you know, like all the things that, that keep us up at night. But as you can see in these 1 million phone calls that um, this data company went through, they found that literally less than 1%, 0.6% to be exact, of police time was spent on violent crime. Um, and I think that shows us in this one example um, that one, um, maybe the city of Austin is, is not that violent of a place. Um, and it, it kind of debunks this notion that we need cops to keep us safe because people are gonna run rampant. Um, and as you can see, like literally out of a million calls that they only went to a little less than 6,000 um, that was quote unquote violent crime. Another key thing to look at here is responsive, this top row. Um, responsive is when people call cops, right? Like they see something that's um, out of the blue. They see something that's quote unquote, not normal. Um, and cops are responding to these calls, right? Like a lot of people have seen um, the memes and things of, of white people that are calling cops on black people and people of color for no reason. That is that category. Um, and we see that 40.2% of APD's time is spent on those calls. Um, and we also think that's really important because again, as we have this conversation around policing and the, the need or not for policing, we have to understand that what policing um, is actually doing is, is not this crime fighting work that I'm sure if policing was in a better state, we would not mind them doing. Um, police are responding to calls that, that maybe civilians could do um, they're responding to calls that can really be fixed if we as a community come together and, and, and learn better and learn our neighbors um, and step in and intervene when we can. Um, and, 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 and again, it just, you know, the, the data here shows us that maybe we don't need police to do everything, right? Like the majority of the time, um, vastly more than any other thing, was, um, was responsive. Um, another really key thing to look at here um, is the property crime. Um, I think the key thing here that is somewhere else down here, and we'll put this out um, for the people that don't have it yet. This property crime is very interesting because when we look at that data, um, they only spent about 4% of the time going to property crime calls and property crime um, crimes um, that, that a lot of these were unsolved. A lot of these were just like, um, nothing they could do because it's really hard to catch people after the property is damaged. Um, and another thing with the property crime that we saw, I believe, was this really interesting piece around um, burglar alarms, right? So um, when you look at that, when you look at to how cops are responding to burglar alarms, we found out, thanks to Kathy Mitchell and Chris Harris, 
that 99.5% of the burglar alarms were false alarms. So these are people that, like many of us, we all do it. We, um, if you have a, a burglar alarm system, either you forget to set it and you come home, it goes off. Um, maybe you're in a panic or you're in a rush, you don't know the code. Um, so after a certain amount of time, it triggers the police and then they're on their way. Um, but then when they get there, they realize that it was it was a non-issue, it was a non-crime. Um, and it, you know, again, I think this this data is is very important because it helps us reshape and and, and control the narrative around what police are actually doing. Um, when you look at the traffic um, um, rate, twenty three percent, which is um, not a lot. I thought it would be way more than that because we see so many cops on the streets here in Austin. Um, but the fact that they're that they're really not even doing that um, maybe poses the question: Who can? Who else? What other entity? What other organization? What other group? or the creation can go to traffic calls because there's also a conversation that that um, allows us to imagine, you know, what if police, what if these people with, arm, with you know, with weapons um, didn't show up to a fender bender or a traffic wreck? Um, because, you know, in all actuality, um, do we really need them to do that? Um, so this data, which is public um, and I'll put in the chat, and I'll put um, on our website and I'll put on Facebook and everywhere where people can get it. This really shows us that um, not a lot of the things that we think police are doing is actually being done by the police. So um, Greg, I don't know if you have questions for me about this, um, but other than that, you know, back to you. People, I'll ask questions here in a minute, but I think what part of what you're showing is, you know, there are folks out there saying that we don't care about public safety. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I think part of what we're all talking about here is how to make things safer. And and I was surprised at how at these numbers. Honestly, I knew they would be it would be low. How much time they're spending on violent calls, but it's um, it's really low. Um, Chaz, also, you guys did a budget tool with the community. I don't know if you want to share top line uh, what people said they wanted to see money on. See yeah, money. Yeah. I got I got all the tabs open. <laughs> um, so this was also a very um, interesting tool. Um, let me screen share again. Yeah. So so again, uh, we did this. We did this really cool um, budget tool where we created, and it was it wasn't a knock to the city, but the city had a budget tool that only allows you to take away twenty million from the police, um, and we find that very limiting. Um, we wanted to see what people actually thought of defunding. What did defunding look like to the average citizen? So uh, we put together this tool that, you know, we put in the budget data and it allowed people to take or add however much money that they wanted um, from any department and put it towards things that they deemed um, important to them. Um, and as we see... Yeah, I give everybody the top line highlights because we do want to get over to... to yeah. Budget 101 so, here. Yeah, yeah. So, so the tool showed us that 95% of people support divesting from the Austin police budget. Um, and this was the average desired cut per person, $236 million out of 434, uh, 440. Well, Greg is going to talk about that. Um, so that was about 54% of people that took this tool. Um, and I want to keep in mind that this was 1,500 unique um, um, users from Austin. This was not people from California and wherever else. These were 1,500 people um, from all over the city. 91% um, of people support decreasing the number of Austin police officers. Um, and as you can see, like we literally had people in almost every area code um, have access to this tool. Um, and I'll just go through a, a few other things. We saw that people on average um, increase the public health budget by $36 million, which is almost 80% of the people that use this tool. Uh, we saw that people on average increase the housing budget by $42 million, which was again about 80% of people that use this tool. Um, the average EMS budget saw an increase of almost $20 million. That was about 72%, 73% um, of people that use this tool. And then um, something that I believe Amber is going to talk about later is that we saw um, 46, we saw $46 million increase um, to this program that we kind of created within this tool for violence prevention and survivor support, which was literally 90% of 1,500 people. So um, again, you know, we saw some really, really interesting things and we, and we saw that people are very willing to, to reimagine public safety and reimagining 
our budget. So, you know, again, we just, we think this is all useful as we continue to have these budget talks. Great, okay. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I'm gonna give a little budget 101 before we get to our panel of experts. And Chaz, one of our experts from Austin EMS uh, needs the link to join. I just sent you his email. So if you, you, while I'm giving the budget 101, send that to him, please. So um, now that we've got some of that groundwork laid by Chaz, and I so appreciate the Austin Justice Coalition and other advocacy groups getting people to testify and push us because accountability is only good for elected officials. Um, there's nothing wrong uh, with us being held accountable, but also that research um, is really important. So um, now just for the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk, give a little budget 101 because a lot of people are getting involved in the city budget, hundreds that have never been involved before. Um, and basically what happens, y'all may see it in the news, um, by, our, by city charter, which is basically the constitution of the city, the city manager actually assembles the first version of the budget. Uh, it is his job in the, basically the city's constitution. He isn't elected, but he is hired and fired by the city council. And so the city manager put together that first version and he puts together a $4 billion budget, a little bit more than $4 billion. Austin's budget is bigger than lots of other uh, similar sized cities because we have the really amazing benefit of owning our electric utility and owning our water utility and owning the airport, which are privatized in lots of other places. Um, and so those budgets, we kind of think of them separately. Um, there's that the Austin energy budget is kind of separate. Now Austin water and airport are kind of separate because they run themselves in sort of their own way. They, um, they, they get paid by the electric utility rate payers like you and me. And so they kind of have their own budget. Um, uh, they also provide a really great public benefit because instead of profits going to um, people that own shares in the stock market, the profit um, actually, there is no profit. It just goes so that we can keep libraries open or keep parks running, but also a chunk of it does go to subsidizing things like the police department instead of some of those community goods that we're talking about. So there's that $4 billion budget, but about a billion of the 4 billion is the general fund that does things like most cities do. It's the transportation department. It is health and human services. You know, all the folks that are out there giving tests, uh, COVID tests right now. It's the fire department, it's the police department. Um, it is housing. But frankly, overwhelmingly, it's the police department. Over $425 million are the police departments. Uh, and so often, um, as money flows into the city, it tends to just continue to get sucked up into this one kind of catch-all solution for social problems and inequity in our cities, which is arrests and policing as opposed to more effective and compassionate ways of addressing um, our social ills. And so, um, and so we have just continued to see police budgets grow in our country. The city can also sort of set the, the tax rate and how big the budget is, but that's pretty really constrained by the state government. We can't pass a budget and say, hey, we're gonna tax, uh, um, put taxes on a big company more than a small company or have income taxes. All of that pretty much gets banned by the state legislature. So most of the time we're just moving very limited dollars around. So in a world of really limited resources, even though our city is so wealthy, um, unfortunately, we kind of live in a world of austerity in the city of limited resources. We have to decide what those dollars are really gonna go to. And year after year, I've seen the police budget continue to grow. So this year, um, coming up to the city manager shaping the budget, about 10 days before the city manager finalized the budget, there was this incredible push by the community to push the council to, to change that process. And the council passed a couple of things. One was an item that I authored to ban tear gas and to ban facial recognition technology and to ban some of the horrible tactics we saw at past protests. Uh, and another item uh, authored by council member Harper Madison and supported by me said to start reallocating money away from policing for the first time, uh, as long as anybody can remember. And the city manager did that, but he did it just a little tiny bit. I mean, just not very much. That little tiny bit was way more than we've ever seen, at least in a generation, but it is nothing, nowhere near what it, where it is that we need, uh, where it is we need to go. But it's not over. 
we then we have sets of public testimony that come up um, and that public testimony we had a hearing last thursday we'll have another hearing this coming thursday uh, and then before we take votes in early august there will be at least one other chance for public testimony and then the council has to vote on the budget and we uh, can amend the budget so we pass budget amendments uh, where each council member can can move to can make a motion say before I pass there's a uh, the budget gets passed I want to move this much much money from here to there. In the past, we have tried to move money away from policing to other forms of community safety. In my own district, we got people together that were impacted by violence and harm, and people said, "Let's move some police money over to mental health support. Let's move some police money over to support for survivors of domestic violence." Let's have programs to help family violence survivors get out of dangerous situations. And we have managed to make baby steps. But the last two years, both times that I've moved to move a tiny fraction of police money over, those motions have failed. But this year, it seems like there's actually a real opportunity for that major change. And so I'm going to be announcing tomorrow at least a few budget amendments that get us closer to a $100 million goal. One thing we can do is to not have uh, cadet classes cancel at least the next three because we've gotten a report and a second report recently that show that we are not training police officers uh, the way that we should. Um, and we should take a pause on hiring police officers and instead start trying uh, to invest in some of these preventative measures we're gonna hear from um, our experts about. And that could save us somewhere around $20 million, basically between here and our 2022 budget. This is the 2021 budget that we're uh, writing right now. So that's a, that's a $20 million chunk right there. Another really important change that I'm going to propose is that we should um, move internal affairs out of the police department. That is only about $5 million, but it's a massive change because right now, you have people in the same chain of, chain of command investigating their own uh, fellow police officers. And that we know does not create community trust. And when there isn't community trust, we know that makes things worse for everyone. Um, and then another thing we can do is move, uh, that I'm gonna propose tomorrow is moving the forensics lab um, out of the police department, which is also a really significant change. If you all followed the news recently, uh, just a few years ago, we had a huge debacle with our DNA lab. It was being run poorly. We found out that there was decade, multiple decades old backlog of sexual assault evidence. And so it's important to be able to have accountability and justice for survivors. Uh, and having forensics labs in your police department is far from best practice. So those three things combined is like $40 million. And uh, I think Chaz and others are gonna share how we get even closer to 100 or beyond that. But those are the sorts of changes that we can advocate for um, uh, that could start making real shifts. For us to do that, uh, we need the community speaking up about those budget amendments, making it clear what change they wanna see. And uh, it's not just about the cuts, but about where the money goes over to. Because if we actually want to prevent harm, then we can move money away from new cadets over to gun violence prevention. We can move money away from the police budget to mental health response or to housing people experiencing homelessness or for treating substance use instead of thinking you're gonna jail it away. And so that's uh, what the next part of this conversation is gonna be about. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it along to a couple of experts to talk about if we move money away from policing into other forms of safety, what that could look like. Uh, but please do start getting your questions ready. For those of y'all in the Zoom, you can put it in the chat. For those of y'all watching on Facebook, you can put it in the comments. We're watching those comments and we're gonna get to Q&A here in a little while, but just so you know, we are far from being done with the budget. Um, we're gonna be posting, uh, and maybe we can even post now in the chat and on the Facebook, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up, where you can sign up to contact your council members, uh, how you can call them, um, and when the meet, uh, testimony dates are coming up, because basically we are far from done. There needs to be a majority of council to pass a budget, and a majority of council can propose changes for this year, and, even when the budget, budget is passed in August, it's not done. We can amend it at any time in the city. And so we have to keep this movement going. It's not something that we win or lose in August. We've got to keep working through August and then keep this going because we want to keep that change uh, moving. So now I'm going to pass uh, this over 
to, uh, to Amber Goodwin, who's on the uh, gun violence task force. Uh, and she's you know, really as someone who's um, been looking into a lot about alternatives to policing to create public safety. So Amber, you take it away. Great, thank you so much. And I wanted just to start off obviously by, by thanking you uh, councilman, but also Chaz and everybody else who's been fighting out in the community. I think a lot of people um, may think that the fight that is happening right now um, just started a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, but many people in Austin, Austin Justice Coalition, Sufi, everybody has been fighting for a very long time. And so I just wanna thank the advocates who have been working for, for forever. Um, I also want to start off, and I promise I'm not going to try and filibuster this entire conversation, but to start off by just, there's a lot going on right now, but I wanted to spend about 20 seconds and ask folks if you can to just close your eyes, just try and close your eyes, and just imagine what safety looks like to you. Just imagine it. What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Who's there? And I also want you to imagine for the next 10 seconds, the most marginalized person that you know, just imagine what, what does safety look like to that person? What do they need? What do they want? What have they asked for? Just take five more seconds. All right, everyone open their eyes. Normally, if I was in person, we do this for a lot longer and I go back and forth and ask people to, to say what they what they imagined. But I, I say that to start us off by grounding that what you'll hear about today and what people have been talking about in our communities are manifestations of what people have been demanding for a very long time, as well as what people who are marginalized in this country need to not only feel safe, but to actually be able to survive. Uh, today is the 30th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act. There are so many people who have been impacted by the issue of gun violence, by violence in general, um, and have had no recourse, have had no support. There are probably survivors and victims of gun violence who are watching this webinar right now um, that maybe have not had the proper mental health care, maybe have not had the proper support. And so um, as chair of the, the Austin Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, since last October, we have been working together to really ask the question of what does community and public safety look like from the, the Office of uh, Violence Against um, Gun Violence for victims and survivors and starting with victims and survivors, seeing what they need and then going from there. And so I'm gonna go through a couple of just like top line stats. I'll mention what Chaz talked about with what the, uh, the tool said, um, but then also just give a couple quick examples of what other cities are doing and how Austin stacks up. So every year about 100,000 people die by gun violence. Um, in, in the state of Texas, around 4,000, a little under 4,000 people die by gun violence. And in Austin, we don't have an exact number because of the way that the data is collected. But what we do know is that in the age of COVID, um, gun crimes are on the rise. And um, we know that that's either through domestic violence or stolen guns or other parts of the gun, the kind of cycle of gun violence. And what we came up with as a task force by getting impact, by getting information from the community is that we needed to treat gun violence in Austin like a public health crisis. Right now in the age of COVID, everybody knows what a public health crisis looks like. We know that we can't just stop it by one person you know, wearing a mask, everybody needs to wear a mask. And so the issue of gun violence, the trauma and the way that gun violence manifests, but then also how gun violence impacts communities is different block by block, city by city. And so we wanted to attack, tackle the issue really that way as well. Um, the three things that we propose for the city, and I'm happy to share around the Looks like we lost Amber for a second. Did, did you lose her too, JP? Yeah, yeah, I don't have Amber here. Okay, okay. Well, um, we will, um, we'll, um, we'll get uh, her back on here in a second. Um, but it looks like uh, we just got uh, Simon Evans on from EMS. Uh, so when Simon gets his video going, that could be um, we can have him talk next. Um, but. Part, oh, there's Amber. Amber's back. Sorry. I, out. I, I, out. Um, I was just going over the, sorry, if you want, I'll just spend like two more minutes, but. Um, no, 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 no. We were just, we were just filling in your time. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I was just saying the first thing that we said that we wanted to do was a community mapping project. So really assessing what gun violence looks like 
what does every single neighborhood need? What, how does gun violence manifest? One of the data points that I always like to tell people is that in cities the size of Austin across the country, the data that we do know says that less than half of 1% of a city's population, so less than half of 1% of the city of Austin drives over 70% of the violence. So that means that like not everybody is violent walking around the major cities or the city of Austin, um, but there are pockets of violence that most of the people who are in these pockets probably have had violence against them. They probably had some sort of challenges, but really attacking the issue the same way that we would a public health crisis. So doing a, a mapping of the, of the different communities in Austin. And so hiring somebody who's independent from the police department to do that. Right now, all of the gun violence work is done inside the Austin Police Department. And so we'd like to hire somebody who's independent and from the community. Um, second, we would like to uh, have and start an Office of Violence Prevention. And the Office of Gun Violence Prevention would look at all forms of gun violence and would be a centralized body to really um, talk about the issue of gun violence, not only from a pu public health crisis, but also um, be able to collect all of the data that's needed on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Um, they'd be able to hire people who are credible messengers from the community to be able to work with different systems, um, different, different parts and different of the city as well. Um, and then third, we wanted to um, also make sure that we invest in evidence-based strategies and programs that were um, really uh, things that the community has talked to us about. Some of these programs include hospital-based interventions, so working directly with hospitals and people who are uh, susceptible or at high risk to be either victims of crime or people who are perpetrators of crime. And instead of calling in the police department, calling in public health professionals, mental health professionals to help uh, with the issues of gun violence. Um, and then also working on things like cure violence and other evidence-based strategies. And so I'll just say to kind of wrap up the three um, big pieces that we wanted to do as a uh, task force and that we'll continue to push for. We're gonna be continuing to work with the Austin Justice Coalition, Texas Appleseed, other organizations to get our members in Austin and from Travis County to continue to uh, make calls to city council. But um, we want an Office of Violence Prevention in cities across the country, including cities the size of Austin. Um, they have reallocated their budgets, um, some as large as 15 to 20 million this year. Um, cities like Minneapolis, cities like Newark, cities like Oakland, have reallocated funds from policing to go specifically to an Office of Gun Violence Prevention or to help further the Office of Violence Prevention that is already in their city. Um, we wanna reinvest and make sure that we're mapping out independently from the police department what gun violence actually looks like in the city of Austin. And then third, we wanna make sure that we're investing in programs that have had the, that have the evidence, they have the data, but also have the evaluation to be able to dramatically reduce gun violence in Austin. And so. That is um, our, our kind of our demands, but also what we're going to continue to make sure that we're educating the community about as well. Thank you, Amber. I, I really appreciate it. And you know, in, in these cases, you know, people talk about how a you know ounce of prevention is worth pound, hundreds of pounds of of the response. And so we and we really dedicate very little of our city budget to actually preventing violence and harm. So thank you for talking through that. And uh, please put your questions. Uh, to, to Amber in the chat or in this Zoom. Uh, next, we have uh, Simon here from EMS. Thank you for everything you're doing. EMS is on the front lines of violence and harm. They're on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and they're always, you know, they, they really are heroes right now for so many of us. Uh, so Simon, why don't you talk some about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and wh where you think we could be shifting the city budget to make things better for people, um, you know, in the realms of homelessness, substance use, COVID-19, sex work, all of these places where we know we should be doing better. All right, thanks, Greg. You can you, can you hear me okay? We can. Good. Um, so I'm Simon Evans. Uh, I'm a paramedic with uh, Austin Travis County EMS. I've been there eight years, six years working on the ambulance, uh, two years working in community health. Um, I'm here today just uh, expressing my personal experiences um, of working uh, for EMS during the, the COVID, our COVID response um, and uh, representing our uh, EMS association. So, you know, basically, you know, we've, we've been working on the front line since March, so going on five months, it's, we've had to rapidly adapt to things that are changing on, you know, an almost daily basis. Um, 
you know, this is a, a medically driven disaster. So in that respect, we were prepared for that. Um, and that helped in terms of having, you know, just the basics to support our, our medics, PPE, um, you know, pandemic plan, all of that good stuff that's been lacking elsewhere. Um, so, you know, we've, we've done pretty well. We've had, we, we managed to get through about the first four months with only two people uh, testing positive uh, and our frontline medics. Uh, we are now at 13 after the reopening of Texas that kind of hit us pretty heavily. And like everybody else, um, we stabilize now. Um, you know, the hard, I think the hardest thing, you know, for, for our medics is just that a lot of them are having to isolate at home when they get home to their families so they don't bring stuff home, you know, uh, they don't bring COVID home with them. Um, you know, that's, but, you know, even, even with that going on, you know, we've had continued EMS service out there and on many levels has actually been enhanced level of service with lots of new initiatives coming out um, that have been, you know, helping to deal with this very unique situation, you know, and our medics, as, as always, perform their jobs uh, in the face of adversity. But this time, you know, this is just like a whole new level. And I'm, you know, I've got to say, I'm super proud to to work here and to work with the medics that I do. Um, it's been, it's been great. Um, primarily, my work in in community health. So I work out there with uh, people experiencing homelessness. Right. So, you know, the first thing that happens uh, after the local orders against, you know, related to COVID response was that almost every um, social service agency dropped out and stopped providing services to people experiencing homelessness. So EMS, um, our team went out and we basically assessed the situation uh, for APH and just, I mean, those, those first, that first probably two months uh, of uh, March and April, we were doing what I would describe as humanitarian aid within the US, you know, we were uh, bringing water and food to people. We were assessing sanitation needs, trash pickup, um, hand washing stations, we're getting, you know, toilets into places um, where there were large homeless populations. So we didn't see um, massive spread of disease. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a very, very, interesting and surprising time for us. But I mean, as I said, we continue doing our services. We're doing scene diversion where when 911 calls come in for COVID, we're making decisions about whether that needs to go to the hospital, stay at home, go to isolation, um, whether we need to follow up. And our team, my teammates in community health are following up 911 calls for people checking on them. Um, we've, we've still been doing our um, psychiatric pilot out there. We've still been doing our opioid responses. And this is in addition to, you know, the uh, enhanced COVID duties. A number of my teammates have been reassigned to other duties as well, uh, to the isolation facility that the city's running to manage that and to run that, um, to the acute care sites to get those up, and also to what we've called the uh, CCCL or the C3L, which is the uh, COVID um, clinical res uh, con consult line, which is out of the uh, 911 call center. So when you call in and uh, it's COVID related, it's respiratory, it's that kind of stuff, it goes to a paramedic and there's a team of people up there who are triaging those calls and making determinations about how they should be dealt with. Uh, that's, that's at the peak, that's been a hundred calls a day, additional calls a day. Um, and with, uh, you know, 20, 20 to 25 of those having ambulance diversions, that's to say an ambulance isn't responding to that. So that's been highly, highly successful. Um, you know, 25 less ambulance calls a day is one less EMS station that's needed to be added. So, you know, I'm sure Greg knows how much they cost. So that that's that's a very beneficial initiative we'd like to see continue. Um, we've definitely been learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, we've had a hard time with the downtown ambulances. Obviously, there's a definitely a deficit there, um, and when uh, ambulances from other parts of the city come and transport people in to the the hospitals downtown they get picking up they're ending up picking up calls in the central area and not getting back to their, their station so we definitely need to convert some of the part-time ambulances there to full-time and then double up the number of ambulances um, in the central area at existing stations and the beauty of that is that we have the stations already we have the ambulances already it's just a staffing issue and maybe some basic infrastructure 
A um, couple other things I wanted to quickly touch on was, um, I don't know how much uh, folks are aware about the ProLodge system. This is some initiative that City uh, APH put out, which was targeting uh, people who are living on the street who are highly, highly medically vulnerable uh, and getting them off the street uh, into uh, motel housing with wraparound services run by the city of Austin uh, in coordination with a couple of other agencies. And that's taken about 300 people off the streets um, who had a very, very, very high chance, according to the CDC, of dying if they ever contracted COVID out there. Um, and that was part of our kind of pandemic response and management. And I can tell you that, you know, the oldest person who we found out there on the streets and coordinated getting in was 79 years old. We found multiple, multiple people who were in the midst of cancer treatment, active chemo, radiation, living on the streets, uh, dozens and dozens of people with HIV and AIDS and uh, terminal diseases who are living on the streets. So th these are folks who would not necessarily get housed even under normal circumstances um, because of the way permanent, the permanent supportive housing system is set up. So it's been, that's been a really great thing that we've been part of and I've been very proud to be a part of that. Um, something else that, that happened that was very helpful uh, during that time was kind of a slowdown on some of those uh, state run sweeps um, under the, in the underpasses where, you know, in the past, uh, you know, the state had been very aggressive about coming out and uh, moving people, taking their stuff. And we'd, we'd had a lot of very tragic situations there that had set people back uh, by a very long time. Uh, because they hadn't been there when the sweep had come and it had taken away their possessions, their IDs, their birth certificate, everything. Even though they were trying hard, they were going to work, they were living on the streets, they were just, you know, set back. So it's been uh, seeing that kind of back off a little bit has been good. And then seeing the services provided by Austin Resource Recovery, the Purple Bag Program and such, ramping up and filling in that gap has been great. Um, you know, the, 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 those underpass sweeps do nothing but create antagonism between city employees and people living on the street and setting them back in their ability to get off there. I mean, we're talking about people that are highly vulnerable in terrible situations with mental health and drug problems. We can't get off the street and we're just making it worse for them. You know, it also makes it worse for you know, our community health medics because we're going out there doing case management, case coordination, medical follow-up visits. And if the people aren't there because they've been moved on by you know, an underpass suite, then we can't see them again. Um, and this is a major issue for us. So, I mean, we definitely like to see some of that money um, repurposed and moved into other more, I would say, empowering strategies. I mean, I think the goal of the city should always be to empower its citizens um, and instead of disempowering them. So um, that's pretty much it. I think I've said a lot. And uh, I'll let you so much, but it's so important. I mean, y'all are doing basically everything from humanitarian response to a disaster to addressing homelessness. I don't think you even got to all of your mental health response work. We yeah. have trying. the goal this year. I think if we shift this budget enough, is if you call 911, you don't just hear police, fire, EMS, but you would get police, fire, EMS, and mental health because we right. know we have so many use of force incidents and even police shootings that involve mental health cases. I mean, y'all just basically y'all just do so much. And you've talked about how right now you have, um, you have way too little resource. And I think that that's what we're seeing a lot of. So th thank you for everything that you're doing out on the front lines. I mean, everybody uh, that works with you. Um, yeah, thank you for the invite. Of course. And, and if you have to go, it's okay. But if you stick around for a little while, people may have questions up to you. Um, uh, I know that we only have you for a limited time. So now we're gonna talk about one last thing before we get into full on Q and A, um, which is gonna be a little mini training on how to impact the budget because we've got a lot of people in the Q and A asking, well, then what do we do? You know, people uh, just up front, right before I kick it over to Chaz about some of the work AJC is doing. The council hat in Texas, we have a really strict law uh, that I think is generally good. Um, sometimes it has some unintended consequences, but generally does a good job of making sure that things don't get figured out behind closed doors. You see the sausage get made in person. I mean, we are live on TV and live on your screen making amendments. So you can see how people vote. So a budget amendment passes or fails if a majority of council members raise their hand. And it is against the rules for us to secretly meet off screen and figure out um, how to get a majority in a place. 
Uh, in fact, on any given vote, there's 11 of us, only five of us can talk about that vote. So when y'all are asking, hey, who supports this, who doesn't? The answer is I actually don't know. And council members, I think, are moving in a direction alongside the movement to make more change than we could before. Uh, the movement for Black Lives has changed the political reality. I mean, if you had told me a year ago that there'd be a serious conversation about a $100 million shift in the police budget, I think not just me, I think everybody on this call would have told you no way, but it is the movement has shifted that reality uh, because we were losing votes to change 500 or $600,000, much less a hundred million. So, um, so I think the goal is going to be to make, move that money over to things that are impacting uh, low income communities and communities of color, uh, providing housing for people experiencing homelessness, substance use care, family violence shelter, a lot of the things that Simon and Amber described. So how do we do that? Um, uh, Chaz, you can pop in here in a second. I would love for y'all or, or JP to talk about your email campaign and the testimony that you're doing. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit. There's a public hearing on Thursday uh, that people can testify at. So do y'all want to talk about the hearing on Thursday? And then I think the next opportunity, if you can't do Thursday, is August the 12th. But do you guys want to talk about that? Sure. I'll jump in here, Greg. Uh um, so there are, are a number of different opportunities and ways to get involved. And when you talk about sort of building up the momentum for a council hearing, I think that some of the things AJC has been working on is uh, really kind of turning out volunteers to show up and testify, um, preparing a written testimony beforehand and thinking about what you're going to say, thinking about some stats, maybe doing a little research. Um, it can really help to strengthen your argument. But when you're testifying, it's always good to come from a place of your own personal experience. So if you have stories or testimony about how things uh, related to the budget impact you personally or at a neighborhood level, that's also very powerful. Um, uh, another thing you can do is uh, share on social media, right? Um, think about how you can best use your social media platform to really get the word out. Um, you know, tag friends, family members, um, share articles and resources and, and try to drum up as much uh, energy on your social media platforms as you can around these issues. That's extremely important. Uh, Twitter could be a tool, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and also another thing you can do is call. You can find out who your council member is and pick up the phone and call them and speak to someone at their office on their staff um, and, and let them know where you stand. Let them know what, what, what your priorities are for the budget and and that you strongly support this, this, this campaign to divest and reinvest in other areas of the community. Um, and, and so, yeah. About two things right there that I think are really important because we're getting Please. questions. Yeah. New places and we should maybe even mock this up, you and me pretending, maybe you could pretend to be a council member during this. Two things. One, you mentioned social media and I will tell you guys um, that it is really effective. Uh, we we get emails and getting a lot of emails is powerful. I mean, we got 20,000 emails after the protests and that was important. So being one of the millions of grains of sand on that is really important, but just as important is making your voice heard publicly. Cause if you send me an email saying vote for the amendment to move internal affairs out only you who sent the email and me as a council member know you sent it. But if you tweet it publicly and ask the question publicly, or you post about it publicly, um, you know, then everybody in the world knows you asked that question and knows what my answer was. So while, you know, while you're waiting to testify, while a council meeting is going on, even if it's not a council date, knowing who your council member is and asking them publicly on social media is an okay thing to do. And, and some people might think it's weird for me to say that out loud, um, but it's fine for you to do it to me too. Um, and people that agree with me and disagree do that, but that's part of accountability. So, um, the social media emailing, but also posting about it publicly if you can and contacting your council member important. And then the other thing about the phone call piece, you know, if you just call and share your story and say, I want you to change APD budget and invest in new forms of safety, that's good. But even better is if you can ask a specific question. So, um, so JP, do you mind being a council office real quick? Yeah, yeah let's, let's do it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure how well I can play a council you office. Can, you know, or, yeah, yeah, you get, you can do it. <laughs> Sure, but let's do it. You, you call me and, and, and tell me. I'm going to call, gonna call you up. So, you know, you can find your council office. I think we're going to put that in the Zoom and in the Facebook comments where you can find them. 
dial that number. Um, and, and a lot of times people will pick up the phone or you can leave a voicemail if they don't pick up, but I'm calling you now. Hello. <laughs> Hi, you. Is, um, is, is this, uh, is this council member Connolly's office? This is council member Connolly's office. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm a constituent in your, your, um, in your district. And I, I really would like to know if you all are engaged and working hard on reallocating dollars to stronger forms of community safety. Cause I just saw a town hall where it looks like actually police time usually isn't on violence. And, you know, I've seen violence happen in my neighborhood and I don't just want a response and an investigation, but I want to prevent it in the first place. Are you guys working on that in the budget? Thank you for uh, bringing that to our attention. We definitely are working on it, um, but it's good to hear your feedback. <laughs> well, but apart to... from that though, I mean, I'm glad that y'all are working on it. I know that there's actually an amendment to not have the cadet classes, the next three, and move that money over to family violence shelters, because I know that family violence is a big deal, uh, to move it over to gun violence prevention. Would you support the amendment? Do you, are you supporting that amendment? Because it's really important. The, no. uh, I think a couple of council members have said they support it, but I haven't heard. Are y'all supporting that? You know, it's interesting that you should mention that because we've been getting a high volume of calls uh, talking about this lately. We've been getting more calls about this subject than we've ever gotten before. So um, it is now high on our list of priorities of things that we are looking at. And can you write down, can you email me if you all, this, when you all decide, when will you decide whether you're supporting it or not? That is a great question. <laughs> well, can you write down my email address and, and email me back when y'all have decided? Okay. And then, we, and then you can tell me my email address, for example. Yeah. All right. My email address is greg.cassar at austintexas.gov. I'm not sure I would make a great uh, council staff person, Greg, but... <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. Uh, so anyway, I think asking those really specific questions is important. Um, and you can ask those really specific questions of my office. I'm here trying to give you guys the tools uh, not to you know, mess with my colleagues, but to mess with me um, uh, and hold us accountable and, and make your voice heard about whatever it is that's important to you. Um, so, so really ask, you know, tomorrow I will be posting publicly those three amendments we talked about and probably more in the future to stop the cadet classes, to move internal affairs out of APD, to move the forensics and DNA out of APD. Uh, and I hope that we'll have majority support or close to it. Uh, but if we don't get six votes for those, then, then we have to keep on fighting month after month to try to try to get that done. Now, Greg, if I might jump, jump back in here and say one more thing, um, uh, you know, it's important for us to remember also that uh, calling, pressuring council, sending emails to council is really only half of the work. It's, 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 it's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. We need to um, really encourage people to engage in more and more budget conversations with their friends, with their families, with their neighbors. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I, I want to encourage people to try to make a list of at least five other people that you would like to have a budget conversation with. You know, talk to other people about the budget um, and let's start mobilizing. We have to build that energy and that momentum in the community and amongst each other um, so that we can have the kind of uh, public support, sustained public support that this process will require in order for us to really make meaningful change. <laughs> Can I also just say something really quick? I want to just double click on that because I think it's incredibly important. And also it's really cool to be civically engaged and to kind of brag about yourself too and what you're doing to help your community. And so if you're following the councilman, but also if you're following Austin, like follow Austin Justice Coalition, repost, they, are, they have really great um, uh, ways to just repost what they're putting on social media. And even if you don't think it's making a difference. A lot of people on here that I, I know are, are, are some friends and comrades of mine that I, are doing organizing all over Austin. It makes a difference even if one person sees that you've posted that you've called your city council person, it may encourage somebody else to do that. And um, there's a lot of people who may not have the opportunity to hear this information or know about it because you know maybe they're working two or three jobs or maybe they're not on so, uh, social media as much. And so hearing from people like you will be incredibly important. Um, and so I will also just say the last thing that I forgot to say on the gun violence stuff also is a lot of the things that we're talking about when we're talking about, you know, divesting in or stopping funding this is really taking the 
financial and fiscal responsibility back to where it, it should be, which is with the community and with the people. And a lot of the things that we're talking about, especially when it comes to gun violence, the city, the county, taxpayers are paying for it one way, right? So what I tell people all the time is when we're talking about the issue of gun violence, that you're either paying for it on the front end um, by promoting peace and promoting equity and promoting justice on the front end, or you're gonna pay for it on the back end when unfortunately somebody dies or someone shot and survived. And so a lot of the things that you all are hearing about are really about what kind of city do we want Austin to be? And how do we want these funds to be reallocated because they gotta go somewhere, right? Um, and so a lot of the stuff we're paying for, we need to have it in the community. And I just, I know that we're talking a lot about reimagining things, but I just want people to imagine what, again, the most marginalized person in your community needs and that's what we're fighting for. And so. Again, just thank you all for everything you're doing and even spending the time to, to be on the call today. Perfect, we're about to do some more Q&A. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna answer the first couple of questions that I've seen come in uh, on the, I think on the Facebook stream and folks are watching that and texting me. Um, uh, and so one of the questions was, uh, what about testimony? Uh, how does that work? And that's constantly changing you actually call in because our meetings are all online right now. And so that we've got a link that uh, is out there. You sign up to speak uh, on the budget, you, uh, which will it, it'll show you what the items are. We'll have the instructions and you sign up with your name uh, and you will get an email with the information about the phone number to call. And there's basically uh, slots that we've created. Right now, it's about a two hour slot. And so you'll know you'll get called in that two hour time window um, and the mayor will call your name. You'll be unmuted and you'll have two minutes to, to speak uh, and folks will hear you. And I think just telling the story from the heart is powerful. Then that's not like a back and forth thing. Like I just did with JP. That's more if you call a council office, but you have two minutes. Uh, another question that came in was about, I think kind of the thing that JP was mentioning. Uh, what else can we do besides just contacting council offices? And I think JP said uh, right on, Talk, uh, organizing on council is half the job. The other half is organizing in the community. I mean, we saw, um, and, and actually, frankly, supporting council members when they do step up and do the right thing um, is important to show that because when, for example, we stopped having the laws that criminalized people just for being poor, just for being homeless, then we saw this massive misinformation campaign um, that was talking about how that was gonna all of a sudden make more people be homeless, which makes no sense. Right. Um, but it was really important for people not just to advocate to council to change that law, but also to organize in their community to stop the misinformation um, and to make sure that people understood what's going on. Because we're already know we already are seeing increased violence in our community. It's no surprise that in a the biggest public health crisis in, in a century, the biggest economic uh, depression we've seen in a really long time, that there is more violence. And we already see people saying, well, that's because they've already cut the police budget when in fact we haven't even passed the budget yet. So it's really important to go out and talk to people in your community. Uh, so keep posting more questions. We'll answer questions as they come up. Chaz or JP or Amber and Simon, do y'all see any questions here in the chat? Y'all wanna hop on? Yeah, Amber, I think it'd be good for you to answer this question um, because we definitely don't want people to think um, this is what we're advocating for. Um, yeah, so this question was from an anonymous person. Where do domestic violence calls fall in the data um, that I presented? Um, where would domestic violence calls go if police funding is cut? How much money does the city does the city currently provide for domestic violence services? And in which departments can that money be found? It's a great question. Thank you, whoever asked it. Um, so one of the things that I should have said from the beginning is that there are services that are already working around domestic violence victim services that are that we don't actually want cut. And what we actually have seen in other cities is people cut what is actually already working for survivors and um, and victims, and that's not what we want to happen. And so I know Chaz, folks from Texas Appleseed have all been working with a lot of victim services organizations to make sure that we're not only stabilizing what domestic violence actually looks like in Austin and making sure that we're meeting the needs of survivors, but that they're not getting any 
of their um, budgets cuts because a lot of the victim services is inside APD. And so we're hyper aware of that and wanna make sure that we're working with, we have been talking to APD victim services and other departments and the way we've seen, um, and we would like to have you know, this Office of Violence Prevention uh, be able to collect data on things like domestic violence is for the funding of uh, direct services for domestic, domestic violence work that's already happening um, whether that's work in shelters or other organi um, community-based organizations, we want to see them get fully funded. And then in this Office of Violence Prevention, we would serve as a centralized, it would serve as a centralized hub um, whenever it's specifically around gun violence and collecting data around domestic violence. And so that's how we've seen it work kind of as a system um, instead of just kind of one office that sits by itself, um, but working with the Department of Health, working with the, uh, the city, working with the equity office to make sure that they're all working together in one system. Um, and so part of that data collection would be on domestic violence data, but we want to help fully fund the victim services that are actually working right now. And one, you haven't actually haven't added a family violence shelter bed in this city in years and years and years. Uh, and so um, adding beds or creating vouchers for people to get out of a dangerous situation is something that's also, you know, has been on the table. Sorry, I interrupted you on accident, Jess. Two questions that um, I think we should answer. Then I don't. I think a lot of these are really for you. Um, one is for JP um, that he can answer. Is the is the budget survey results going to be online somewhere? So I'll let you answer that after I answer this question. Um, with the proposed reallocation of funds, either the amount from AJC's budget tool or Councilman Kassar's proposed 100 million, um, are there proposed plans in place per department housing health um, services? that citizens can co um, comment in and push for? The answer to that question is yes. Um, and I think it's also really important to say this, um, when, the, when the whole conversation around defunding the police um, started, um, you know, we were the first group to come out and put a number on that. Um, and, you know, we just said a hundred million because, you know, we still believe that a hundred million is nowhere near enough, um, but a hundred million um, in my honest opinion um, is, um, would be, um, a sign from the city that they get what people are talking about, that they hear people and that they want to take the steps into getting to a world where we start taking some big drastic changes. Um, you know, like, like we just left a, a book discussion with Alex um, um, Batali, who wrote the book, The End of Policing. Um, and he said, you know, like, we know that there's not going to be a switch and we get rid of police tomorrow, um, unfortunately. But um, he understood and appreciate the work that, that we do, a lot of other organizations do, um, that we have to take these incremental steps. Now, granted, these shouldn't be baby incremental steps, like kind of huge, you know, like big baby, well, big, not big baby steps, but big steps. I mean, we think a hundred million can do that. And also um, right now, like literally while we're talking, we have folks from Appleseed, Just Liberty and Texas Fair Defense Project that are um, essentially working on showing our work, right? People have asked us, well, how do you get to a hundred million? Like literally right now, I'm looking at a screen of people going to a spreadsheet to show us um, that we can actually get to this 100 million. It's actually very doable. Um, and we plan, we hope to have this done by Thursday, um, but if not, it'll be done before um, the budget vote so we can show people how we can actually get to the 100 million. And then if they wanna get to 250 million, they'll be able, or 300 million, all of it, they'll be able to go in and see how we can actually do that. So um, I hope that answered the question. And then- Yeah, JP, and, and to me, uh, uh, and I, I stand with trying to get to that 100 million goal. Um, that 40 million that I've described is the first three amendments that we've written and vetted. And I'm glad the community is bringing more and other council offices can bring more, but we're putting out, you know, that first 40 uh, tomorrow as we work towards the bigger one. One of the questions is how much can we get to other things? And generally when we work on the budget, first we figure out where we can reduce. So we know how much money there is free before we go and spend it. So it's hard to know how much this can go to homelessness, how much can go to EMS, how much can go to family violence or gun prevent violence prevention until we know how much the council is willing to move over. Um, but we know that we are far behind on each of those categories. I, I think you had a question for JP next. Um, I, the question for me was simple. It's, it's really, it's my job. <laughs> I need to take the results of our WeFund budget survey tool and, and post them on our website. So that will be done in the coming days as soon as possible. And, I, and AJC will share it um, via social media. We'll let you all know that the, that the results of the tool are on our website. We also got a lot of comments on the tool. Like there's a large amount of comments. And so we're finding ways to parse them and, and do some analysis of the, 
just the written some some analysis of all the feedback that people left because there's also a lot of comments so yeah but yeah we, we will share that with everybody <clears throat> i'm gonna try to lightning round round some quick questions that i know are on the facebook that we don't see here uh and some specifically from d4 constituents since this is a bit of a merge of the d4 town hall and ajc's budget work um um, and it's important that it's D4 because we know people in District 4 are disproportionately impacted by violence more than anywhere else in the city. Um, and we should be directing a lot of these resources to communities that have been underserved by the city the most. And District 4 and arguably is one of those places. Uh, so one question was um, uh, about uh, sex work, you know, and, and I mentioned Monica Loera's name, who was um, a sex worker who was killed early on in my uh, time as a council member. Uh, and, and one of the things we need is to move money over to proactively engage people, because we know that uh, poverty, substance use, sometimes uh, human trafficking, um, a lot of that stuff all gets wrapped up um, in some of the areas where uh, we have um, the worst outcomes for people. And so we need to be proactively engaging um, with community members, not just responding to 911 calls when things get really bad. And that's part of what I hope, so that's part of what some of the folks at EMS uh, and in neurological care are great at, but we just don't have a lot of that programming in North Austin. So I hope that we can actually move money over to that and specifically say it should go to where preventing 911 calls and the places we're getting the most of those 911 calls. Also got a question from Diana Spain. So that, and I think that question was from Lynn Galbraith and another uh, and that question also came to us from Andrea Kinnison. So thank you guys for saying that. Um, got a question from Diana Spain about uh, the police association. Uh, and unfortunately, really, they have continued to uh, spread misinformation. Um, uh, their leadership says things like calling out racial injustice is race baiting. Um, it's really unfortunate. Um, and it frankly makes everybody less safe. And so I think the best way we can counter that misinformation is we have hundreds of people uh, that are watching this town hall right now. There are thousands of people that have emailed council members. T after we push council to do the right thing, turning that energy outward and calling out the misinformation is really important because it's just uh, really irresponsible um, what police association leadership has been doing in this city. Um, and, and it takes people power to, to counter that. Um, and then I got uh, one more question that I'll, uh, uh, quickly lightning round here, which is what are the sorts of, of counter arguments that I'm hearing um, or pressure that I'm facing? Uh, you know, the biggest pressure and challenge is just how to do it right. Um, it is, we've never done that, you know, as a country, we've been really off on this point for a long time. So we really have to try to get it done right. And it's something that is hard to solve in a second. And so we have to commit to it. That's a big pressure that haunts me. Um, but one of the big things we get is people that have been misinformed that what we're trying to do, that we don't care about harm. And the fact is we do. If, if massive policing and big jails and prisons actually led to more safety, we'd be the safest country in the world. But we're far from that. So clear, we need to get the message out that clearly what we've been doing isn't working. And that the reason, one of the key reasons we're in this is to make people safer. And for, for now, it's just a lot of people have been confused, um, sometimes by cynical actors, um, into thinking that what we're trying to do is increase crime, when in fact, what we're trying to do is actually make things better for people. So um, just really quickly wanted to run through each of those. And I think council members increasingly are hearing that. So you've got to raise your voice to in the community. All right. Uh, what other questions are there out there that maybe Amber or Chaz or JP or Simon or somebody else can get on? Um, Greg, I did want to ask a question, <laughs> a question of my own, but I think it might be a question that other people have, um, which is some of these new departments that are being talked about, they will probably take some time to, to develop, to sort of be, become a reality. Um, do we imagine sort of a transition period for them? And has there been some thought or some discussion around what that kind of transition process could be? while a new department is being created and yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we, the, I think the, the goals that we are setting, what we, the budget is a planning document for the next year. And so we, we understand that once we say, for example, forensics should be run by scientists and it should be objective 
and it shouldn't be entangled with law enforcement. When we vote, it's not like the next day there's a new head scientist of forensics, right? You've got to do a search for that person. You've got to interview the best scientist you can and hire them. Uh, and we know that that takes time. And so the, if we change something in the budget, then it is really a directive to the city that it's got to happen this year. So it's really a plan for the year. Some folks have asked, how does that transition work? Right? It's not like we say, hey, we need to get to 911 where there'll be mental health response and we vote on it. And it's not like the next day, all of a sudden, there's 50 more mental health professionals suddenly working at the city. So it does take basically a, um, some transition over the course of the year. Also got a bunch of questions about the, the, the city manager and the police chief. Um, as you all know, um, I, I believe that the, the police chief should resign. Uh, the city council doesn't have the power to fire a police chief or any police officer. It's against the, the constitution of the city, the charter for us to, to vote on that. So we don't have that legal authority, but we can hire and fire the city manager. And I take that really seriously. Um, he was hired and brought in as a progressive who wanted to make things better for working class people, um, um, who was going to be taking police accountability really seriously. And uh, I've had that conversation with him. So he had about 10 days to make a major shift in the budget. I think he made a small shift, um, one that looked major compared to previous years, but was not major for the community. Um, and so I have seen, you know, council has always changed the budget. And so the way I'm going to measure it is, let, will he help us make that big sh shift as we vote on these amendments, or is he going to get in the way? Um, and my hope is that he helps um, and, and that he implements that transition I just described to JP well. Uh, that will be one of the measures. And I expect to see a significant change in police leadership, uh, because otherwise the only thing we can do is hire and fire the city manager. Or we could consider maybe um, in the budget closing some executive positions um, might be another option. And so I, I really think that it's it's hard to talk about change at the department when people um, see the leadership that we have and, and I'm still calling for that change and we need people to keep that in the conversation as well. I, I, think, it, another, I, I think another good question is um, for Simon, if he's still on, um, how can we ensure that I, if I we can- around. If you're not, it's okay. I think he might've had to go. Simon, click your video on if you're around and if yeah, you're not. Okay. I think he's there. Um, um, how can we ensure that if we can get money shifted to EMS and CHP, um, to assist with COVID primarily, that these entities get to keep this funding long-term. They have been underfunded for years. So Simon, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. Uh, I mean, I guess with that really, I mean, uh, the, the kind of funding that we need is funding towards, you know, more staff so we can convert ambulances from part-time to full-time. We can add um, we can add ambulances, like double them up at stations that only have one currently, you know, stuff like that. Th those kind of um, those kind of changes are, you know, they're going to be ongoing, right? As opposed to, you know, stuff that's just specific to the COVID response right, right now. That's my short answer. Thank you for that. Um, and we've got about, you know, we're kind of over time, but if we have so many people still signed in, uh, are people here okay with taking maybe three or four more questions? Is that all right? Yeah, and I was just gonna also add, um, there was a couple questions about domestic violence and I just saw um, one of the, my co-authors for the, on the gun violence prevention report, Shelly Eager is also, and so I'll make, she's also on here. So she's put a couple things in the chat just in response of how domestic violence can work with the Office of Violence Prevention. And then I'll also make sure that her contact information is sent around to everybody. Great, thank you. Um, do y'all see some more questions here in the Q and A that y'all wanna? Do you wanna answer? Um, I'm happy to talk about a couple more. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I see one that I think you would like. Um, how much did the housing cost, and can we keep housing people experiencing homelessness like that after COVID? I think that's a good question. Yeah, we are have housed more people experiencing homelessness um, here in the in the COVID crisis than ever before. And it is a goal of mine to make sure that nobody is sent back to the streets from these hotels. And we need to keep those folks housed and house even more people. And so that is a major goal. Um, within the current budget, I don't know if that's what we'll achieve. So we've got to shift the budget to do that. And we need the federal government to vote on the HEROES Act. Um, Congress passed over 70 days ago a bill to make sure that local governments 
um, can keep on doing what they're doing because we're really the front line on COVID. Um, and the Senate has refused to vote on it. Um, uh, Mitch McConnell has not even taken it to a vote. And so actually this Thursday, I have a resolution on the agenda that I think will unanimously pass calling on the HEROES Act to pass so that we can keep people housed um, and, and keep uh, and have the funding, some of the extra funding we need to keep our EMS workers um, and our public health employees doing what they're doing and to help some of our small businesses equip themselves um, uh, for, for being safer. Um, so that's part of what we're trying to do. All right, and then there's one more question for Simon, who I know is trying to relax on that really comfy looking red couch. Um, question for Simon, knowing EMS's role in helping with homelessness, doing case management and mental health services, et cetera, do you recommend increasing the budget for EMS to be able to continue to do this more effectively? Or do you recommend increasing the budget of other services so that they can do these tasks and take the responsibility off EMS? In general, thank you for the hugely important role you played in empowering and helping our homeless, uh, homeless community. Oh, I appreciate the compliment, thank you. Uh, so this is a difficult and I guess somewhat, going to be somewhat controversial response, but I mean, you know, that I think that what the, the agencies and the organizations that work with homeless, the ones that the city should be funding and, and working with, you know, should be the ones that continued working during COVID. I mean, that's a pretty good uh, filter right there, I'd say. The majority of you know so-called essential social services just dropped off the radar and stopped working um and a lot of that that slack had to be picked up by by other agencies um particularly the city you know so i mean what i learned what i learned basically from the covid response so far and just about case management and helping homeless is that we can't rely on outsourcing those services to other agencies because th those agencies aren't necessary. We can't control what they do during a pandemic. We can't, um, you know, they, 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 some of them have proven not to be dependable. So, you know, whatever budget we're gonna, we're gonna dedicate towards, you know, solving the homeless problem, whether it's PSA, you know, permanent supported housing, transitional housing, any of that stuff. Um, I'd like to see the majority of it going, staying within the city itself, because that's, that's what we have control over. And that's where we can, that's where we can uh, have accountability. Right now, there's a lot of money going into um, housing people who are homeless, but not so much. Um, maybe, I guess it's about quality, not quantity, right? So if you take someone off the streets who has mental health problems and they have addiction problems and they have other stuff and they've been on the street for 20 years and you put them in permanent supportive housing and then you just give them a key and say, hey, there you go and expect them to be to succeed it's just not going to happen there has to be you know that there, there has to be there has to be an ongoing process working with the, with folks to get them reintegrated back into you know, everyday life and that's not necessarily what third party agencies are doing you know like once someone's in housing that's a that's a box tick the data's there success boom it doesn't matter if they're not in that, they're not housed still six months later so um that's really you know my, my perspective of what i'm seeing out there, um, we, yeah, anyway, there we go. Thank you, Simon. Um, a, a couple of other questions we're getting. Some people have tried to sign up to speak and they can't. And I forgot to mention that the signups don't open until 10 a.m. tomorrow. So that link we sent, once you, as soon as you go, you know, between 10 a.m. tomorrow and a noon on Wednesday, you can sign up to speak. The item is item number 17 is the budget. Um, and so, so, you know, anytime, uh, after tomorrow morning up until Wednesday, you can go and, and click the link. Um, also got a question about, um, about if you can't talk on Thursday, are there other good days? And actually, potentially the most important day is August 12th. That's the first day that we'll actually be taking votes on the budget. So you can, we'll also eventually, once you get closer to August 12th, there'll be a sign up for that day. Um, and then when we're debating the budget, that might be a good time to be on social media, to be watching the council meeting. Uh, because usually uh, there's an audience sitting in the council chambers while we're voting on the budget, but we don't have that when we're online. And so actually staying engaged and not just going away uh, when we are voting on the budget on August 12th would be important. We might actually roll over and take a second day on August 13th, maybe even go to August 14th. It's po very possible that there may not be testimony on those days because council may need time 
to actually uh, deliberate and argue about the budget. Um, and sometimes, you know, we, we, that, that time is important. So August, you know, this Thursday, July 30th, definitely August 12th, potentially August 13th might be one more chance to talk, but maybe not. Um, uh, but there will be at least those two more opportunities. Uh, and then I got a question about um, the backlash. And I think that that is, uh, I think that was in the Facebook uh, and that is very possible. I mean, we already see some of it happening and it'll be really important that it, whether we get to hundred million or 120, or even if there aren't enough votes and it's just 50 or 60 or 70 million that gets moved over, we know that um, uh, there will be people who try to make it sound like, and we're seeing this happen in other cities, making it sound like we don't care about public safety um, when we truly do. I mean, if you listen to this conversation, everyone here cares about making our community safer. And so it'll be really important to keep organizing well past this budget. Any other questions you guys have seen? Maybe we can answer one more before we close out. Looks like they're most, we've answered a ton of them. Um, keep was, following AJC, keep in touch. JP, you got something? There was one question about, uh, a way for attendees to get a resource list after this. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's been covered. Yeah, just you know, stay plugged in on my social media, AJCs. We also know Grassroots Leadership, CCU, Just Liberty, um, uh, Texas Appleseed, a lot of these groups are working on it. So just you know, stay in touch, keep, keep working, keep talking to, to your neighbors about this. It's really uh, important. I really wanna thank you, Amber, for being on here. Thank you, um, Simon. Uh, this is a really, really um, important time. Um, you can uh, keep following my my newsletter as well. We will keep you um, we'll keep you posted. I've I've been um, I've learned a lot in this job, um, and and the budget has always been such a hard thing to do. When I came on the council, we uh, had neighborhoods, you know, low income neighborhoods in the city that didn't even have a park that had been fighting for years to just have a park. We had a swimming pool. But what we were fighting was just to have a sign telling people what it was called and that it was a public swimming pool. And so much of the money just kept drag getting dragged into one place. And it um, has so often been kind of like a third rail in city politics to touch the police budget. And that's a problem. Um, and finally, we have this opportunity to talk about it differently. And it's uncomfortable and it's hard and it's not politically expedient, but we've got to do it if we want to make things, um, if we want to make things better. Um, you know, D David Joseph being killed and early on in my uh, time on council is probably one of the things that has changed me as a person the most. Um, you know, somebody who was a high schooler, um, I had actually spoken at the high school graduation from his high school just uh, a few months before it happened. Uh, he was a junior there and I talked to the senior class. And, and the fact that some, a young person in a mental health crisis naked, that our response as a city, the best supposedly what we could do was show up and just seconds later have him killed is just, it just shows how broken this is. And so if we care about safety, if we care about lives, then we need to have a, something better for people like David and his family. We have to have something better for, um, for people like Mr. Odias who was killed. Uh, we have to have something better um, for, for people that have COVID-19, we have to have do things for, our, we have to have medics um, that can help answer phone calls and not just be dealing with a humanitarian crisis, but actually going and helping people. We can do, we can do better. And, and it takes having this hard conversation and not just treating people as a problem, but recognizing that we all, we all have to step up. Um, and so thank you all for participating in this. It's such an important moment. It's a really serious thing. Um, and I feel blessed to be a part of a city that is, that is trying and we have these organizations trying. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, and thank you to AJC for co-hosting this. Uh, Chaz, do you want to say anything to close this out? Um, no, you know, I, I just want people to um, know that this is not, like the fight doesn't end August 12th. Like, you know, this budget process is something that's going to take years and years. Um, so, you know, I think people should just be ready to engage um, as much as they can um, for the long haul. Um, and then also, you know, I think it's really um, important for AJC and for me to um, end on this note. I'm not saying I'm the last person speaking, but, um, you know, we stand in solidarity with, uh, again, all the protesters that are on the front lines. We stand in 
solidarity with Garrett Foster's family um, and his fiance. Um, and it, you know, it's actually a vigil tonight for people that want to go out um, at Fourth and Congress. Um, and I think I'm going to head out there to, to to be with the community as we are mourning. Um, and you know, I, I think it's so many things that we have to fight. But this is one policing is one thing, um, and it's a really important thing because it's it's depending on the side of town you stay on, how much money you make, and more importantly, what you look like. Um, it, it's not it, it's something that needs to be drastically changed. So. Um, thank you all for just joining and being part of this and we look forward to working with you. I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything. I, I think that that's, I think that's, I think that's there to end on. Thank you for sharing about the, about the vigil. Good night, everyone. And, and y'all take care out there. We'll, uh, I'll see you on the other side of the virtual dice.